Hello again, Strandberg Hello. fans, and welcome to another Stranded live stream. Um, for me, it's evening. Good evening if you're in Europe. Uh, good morning, etc. If, if you're in the US, um, which I assume that many of you are. Um, I'm thrilled today to um, kind of do another product launch. Uh, we've been doing some of them, uh, right, left, and center. This one we actually launched a while ago, um, but we're catching up with the signature artist um, today, Sarah Longfield. Hello. Hey, Sarah. How How's are you? Going? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. It's been uh, too long since we spoke. It's, I can't even remember when. I mean, years, Except I think. Yeah. yeah. It's been a long time. And um, for anyone that's um, following you online, you have a brand new hair color, I think. <laughs> yeah, you can't really see it as much in this light because it's super dark, <laughs> but it's red. <laughs> when I'm out of my bed. Well, so obviously, um, to those of you that are watching us on Facebook or YouTube today, um, start asking your questions in the comments field. And um, Sarah and I will chat for a bit and let the questions accumulate. Our excellent uh, moderator, Isaac, uh, behind the scenes will uh, pick out your, your questions and we'll forward them to Sarah, of course. So. Um, and we almost had uh, another special guest, Boots, join us, but I, I guess you dumped him in a different room. <laughs> he was um, very noisy. Very, he talks a lot, so it's not good for streaming. <laughs> yeah. But how, so how, how much um, like how, how much time are you able to, to spend uh, at home with, with Boots and how much is like, because you're in college, how much is like actual classroom uh, classes? Well, classes are back and fully in person. So I would say I'm usually like they, they start at 930. And then like my first class, there's only two a day. Um, and like one is two and a half hours. The other one is actually almost six hours. So it's like 930 to noon. And then I go home and let him out or Derek does because he's uh, independent contractor. He does like photo work for real estate agents. So he's home every couple hours as well. So when I'm like at right. school, he stops home every couple hours and we're both home by five. So Boots, he doesn't get too lonely between like, mm -hmm. I have Thursdays off. Derek usually has a few days off. So he's, he's taken care of. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And uh, you have to tell us, cause that, you, you told me just when we did the, the technology test before, uh, it sounded very, um, intriguing for someone like me your project right now is is constructing or designing a, a set of chairs with different or seating arrangements yep yep um we have like yeah basically different chairs things that have you have to be able to the rules are kind of loose like you have to be able to sit on it um and it has to be able to like hold someone's weight um and there's like various design restrictions for each one um so i was finishing that up uh, until four in the morning last night, just building things and sawing things and gluing things and staple gunning things. And so, because I just learned how to upholster furniture. So yeah. I upholster everything, <laughs> <laughs> the whole the whole stool, the whole chair. It's just fluffy and fuzzy. <laughs> That's awesome though. How, how, how do you think uh, designing these kinds of objects relate to uh, writing music? How, how does that I fit into your artistry? I think it's so interesting because I'm also in like some product design classes and mm. there's like, like I'm a super like out of the box chaotic person, but like in furniture design and product design, it's so methodical and there's like these steps that you can take, but at the same time, there's like such a beauty to it. And I think music is kind of the same way. like. There, it's very methodical. There's these specific steps that you're taking when you're writing and when you're creating. and But it's also so unique and, and very beautiful in the end product. 
or not beautiful, depending on what you're going for musically, I guess. So Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's very Mm -hmm. nice to have the contrast, you know, between the two, Uh, like when I'm stuck in music or like my album is being mastered right now. Thank God that's done. Um, (laughs) It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, it's good able to take a break and bounce between something that's totally different and just like get in that headspace for a while so I don't overthink something that I just did musically and be like oh my god this this record suck like no I'm not thinking about that I'm thinking about what fabric I want to upholster my stool with (laughs) so that's awesome it's yeah it's fun yeah and I mean you you've always been like multidisciplinary disciplinary yeah Mm -hmm. did I say that kind of right so um, for anyone who may not know the history of your awesome signature guitar uh, tell us the 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 story about the artwork how how that came about show show your guitar but ooh, yeah Yeah. so this is the the brand new yes I love Gordon it. It's and beautiful. Field. Yeah. Um, awesome. So, so yeah, yeah, I, before we talk about the specs, t- tell us the story again about the, the artwork. Because that you designed that yeah. and it's very, very cool. It, I I like I think the story of like how we like came together on this is is really cool. It's such a unique, you know, like two kind of artistic people, you know, like your guitars are kind of like an art in and of themselves. And then like I make art and we ended up like working together way back in 2012, I think, 2012 or 2013, maybe. And uh, you like, after I had played the Strandberg guitars for a little while, um, you reached out and asked me if I wanted to paint one because I was posting a lot of my paintings at the time. And I was like, I didn't even know you could do that. <laughs> what? So, uh, so yeah, Ola sent me um, just an eight string body and I, I panicked about it uh, for like three and a half months. I was like, I am going to just destroy this guitar and it, everybody's going to say that I ruined a Strandberg and I'm going to feel so guilty forever for ruining a beautiful, like, like luxury Strandberg guitar. Um, and then so 30 minutes before I told uh, the guy that I was going to drop it off with who was going to finish it, um, I just like slapped some paint on and was like, OK, this is it. This is going to have to be it. And I'm just going to have to if I ruined it, I ruined it, whatever. And then uh, I got it back a few weeks later and I loved it. I mean, I was like, you know, this is so colorful. This is so me. (laughs) Like I didn't expect anybody to really, you know, it to be the, um, the, the attention grabbing thing that it has become. Um, I was just like, yeah, this is just my favorite little guitar that I painted. Woo. Uh, And now it's taken on this, this life of its own. Um, Like, I think separate from both of us, I like, I like there are famous people buying these that have no idea who I am <laughs> and maybe don't even know the history of Strandberg, just saw it in a shop and we're like, oh, cool. You know what I mean? So it's like, like it's grown <laughs> so far above and beyond um, <laughs> where I ever could have imagined it going. Um, but yeah, so I think that's kind of the story. And I think, yeah, it's, it's so cool that something that was just a genuine, like, oh, this would be really fun on both ends turned into this like production guitar that people are are still buying it blows my mind <laughs> like we've had this this model out for a couple of years now in various iterations and like people still tag me oh i just got this guitar i love it, it making videos with it and that's like every time i wake up to that i'm just like whoa <laughs> so crazy so yeah yeah it's it's very i mean mean, it's it's striking it's not like anything else really so um yeah i love it and and of course i mean obviously now we 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 reproduced it digitally or or you reproduce it digitally and and it's it's like transferred to the guitar in in a pretty involved process which you can actually see on youtube when when we released this guitar the first time we made a video about how it was made so um if you're curious um, check that out. Uh, I can't point you exactly to it, but it's it's up on our YouTube channel. Yep. So uh, yeah, it's been out for a while, and and this is the latest um, rendition of it, which we call Bowden NX, which has some updates that we brought along for I mean, the, the, the entire product line, basically. So talk us through what what the updates are. 
Well, some of my favorite updates, I love the rich light fretboard because um, as some of you know, I live in Minnesota and the weather here is just beyond chaotic. It is the driest place I have ever lived. You will wake up with a nosebleed like every day, <laughs> no matter how many humidifiers I keep in the house, all of my instruments, my like cello, my ukuleles, they're all super susceptible to temperature change no matter what I do and humidity change. So the rich light fretboard is a, is huge for me because it just doesn't move. It's not shrinking. It's not expanding. You know, there's no moving of the frets at all. Um, and so it's just so stable, which I think was an, like an excellent decision in addition to all the rest of the stability that the guitar has. You know, I think it just makes sense um, in line with like what Strandberg is going for and has achieved. Um, and I also, I love how it sounds. It's super resonant. Like, I wasn't sure what to expect from, from a composite fretboard, but like when you, when you, like that's a ton of sustain for something that I don't know if you could hear that, but it's not plugged in and I easily just got like, you know, <laughs> it goes forever. It's a super, super resonant choice for a fretboard. So I love that. Um, I also love, this is a more subtle detail, but up here, this is all one piece now. And that is, just truly uh, a gift. I didn't even know how much I would appreciate that subtle change in the hardware, but it's excellent. Uh, it makes changing strings way faster. Um, and then you also have new, new buttons um, and new heel carve with all the NX models. So I'm gonna see if I can, yeah, there you go. You can kind of see how, how smooth and like rounded the heel carve is now. It's so comfy to play. I mean, it was great before too, but it's like even better now. It just really rests in the palm of your hand, like right right in here. Um, so it's just so comfortable. Um, and I would say those are probably my favorite things about the new NX models um, and specifically in my NX model. So I don't know if there's anything you want to add, Ola. No, uh, I, I can just echo your, your sentiments about, about the rich light. Um, I, I was skeptical after just having tried it. Uh, I mean, when, when you build guitars, what you do is, is um, you pick up the wood and, and you tap it and, and hear what, like, what the tap tone is. And generally, you, you want to like mix higher tap tones and lower tap tones and, and kind of balance that out. And rich light was more of like cardboard, <laughs> no, no tone at all. So I, I was expecting it to be awful. Uh, but once we tried it, um, it, it, it just blew me away. And I, I think it, it, it feels a little bit different. It, it affects like how the neck vibrates in, in, in some way. Uh, so it's, it's a different feeling playing it, but in, in a positive way. Yeah, I was gonna say, so, I, I like that. I like the change. I think the fretboard, it feels, yeah. it feels like, a, you know, a really well-oiled ebony fretboard. It feels like it's always just well-oiled. It's very smooth, very comfortable. And yeah, it definitely, I know what you mean with like the neck resonating more. I think that's just, I don't know, it's, it's super unique, but in a really good way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, it is more sustainable than uh, a tropical hardwood like ebony, which, which is getting really hard to source uh, as well. So, um, I mean, it's, it, it's a win-win, uh, just good in all fronts, I think. Agreed. So this, this is the eight string, and uh, you also have a six string um, out, which the, the, so basically the, the, there was a six, seven, eight based on the metal model. Now yes. that's the eight that's become an X. And then your six string is based on the standard model to, to make it more affordable. Yep, that's what we were looking to do with the, um, like, I remember, I think we were talking about this a year ago. I think the last time we were doing this live stream, um, I was like, is there any way we could do an, an iteration of this guitar that's just maybe more accessible? Because I know you had just released the standard line. Um, and you were like, yeah, yeah, let's totally do that. We made a few changes to make it less expensive, but in my, I, they were purely cosmetic. Um, and some people prefer it. Like the six has a matte finish on it instead of the gloss finish um and it comes with like standard like passive pickups they're in like what looks like an active housing but it's a five-way passive and they sound phenomenal i've told i've had people tell me they love the sound of the pickups um and some are happy it didn't come with active pickups um 
So that's cool, but you know, it's easy to swap out if you do want that. Um, but yeah, no, and the six is just, like I said, there's no compromise on any of the important features. Um, we just found a way to make it a little bit more affordable, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the standard line is, is it, it's no less guitar than anything else in, in the lineup. It's, it's just constructed a little differently. It's, it's not chambered uh, for, for one, so it's, it's, it's a simple construction. Yeah. But so in uh, what would you say your ratio of, of playing on, on a six string versus the eight string nowadays in, in what you compose? Um, well, so I think when I was first really diving into figuring out what my style was, like, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years ago, I was very inspired. So like I've been a drummer most of my life and I marched in like drum corps and so that was hugely influential on my playing and obviously when I saw Tosin play I was like oh he plays percussively like this is you can play drums on guitar like what so when I first started out I was like, very curious about like you know like the rhythm and the texture and like the percussion of something you know what I mean um and like with my like inclination to tap to make things easier it just made sense to be playing you know, and have like the, the seven and eight string have such a unique, like it's something you just can't get on a six. You know what I mean? You can use them for so many more things other than just like a low bass note. Like you can really use it to like emphasize, you know, like if you're playing like a melody up here, you can be thumping or tapping or like hitting those low strings to get like even like walking bass lines at the same time. So the eight string for me really helped me figure out, you know, my sound and where I was going but then I realized when I met Dave Dunsire um he's another Schamberg player and he toured with me a little bit um and he's toured with a bunch of people now uh he we just kind of sat down and watching Dave play on a six seven or eight string is just like it's like watching magic be made um he he's just he makes it sing and I was like how do you do that like I'm trying to play the same notes as you but mine sound like garbage <laughs> <laughs> and so through just like observing Dave on um, the tours and watching him practice and pra watching him play, I was like, I want to learn how to do that. Like, I feel comfortable with the tapping and the thumping and the percussive stuff and like the odd metered weird rhythms. Like, you know, that's that I feel good about. But I, I didn't really understand like the melodic lead, like soloing or lead stuff, you know. Um, so I really tried to internalize what he was doing and that was easier for me to do on a six, I found out. Um, so when I tried to practice that, because it limited me, there's something to like creative limitation, you know what I mean? That can sometimes spark ideas. Um, and so when I sat on the six, I was like, oh, this doesn't have what I usually like to use and what I was used to. So it forced me out of my comfort zone. And I was focusing suddenly a lot more on melodic choices and like phrasing and timing and finger tone, um, which was something that I, because I was pretty much self-taught um, like I said, I watched YouTube videos and like learned how by looking at them playing things on YouTube. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when I sat down and really analyzed what, what I was doing and where I wanted to be, I figured the six string fit for that. Um, and so I do play the six string a little bit more than the eight string currently, just because my focus has been for the last few years, really developing like a melodic style and like you know expanding my like capabilities in that way like I don't really feel like I need to get any faster you know like I feel comfortable shredding <laughs> um so now it's like I really want to go back and understand like the nuance you know in in the individual notes and how that can like speak through music in a way that is completely different from like percussive rhythmic textured elements if that makes sense mm -hmm. and Add to that a lot of electronic music and, and synths. So yes. what, what, what's the ratio of electronic stuff versus guitars? <laughs> oh, right if now. What's been... the ratio of six string, eight string? Yeah, right, right. Well, right now I'd say it's a solid 70, 30, 70 electronic music, just because um, my brain loves novelty. And when I don't understand something, uh, it's just the best feeling in the whole world. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what any of this is. And now I get to figure all of it out. Um, so for the past, like since quarantine started, I was like, uh oh, I'm trapped in my tiny apartment. We lived in the just smallest, smallest apartment um, and I couldn't go anywhere. And uh, they, school was closed down and I was just stuck there all the time. I hated it. I was stuck in my head and I was like, I need to do something. And so I just started... <laughs> 
<laughs> dug into my savings account and I was like, whatever, I'm gonna learn drum machines and synths and trackers. And, and then that evolved into me getting into Euro rack, which is just like the ultimate time suck and wallet drainer. Like it's not necessary, <laughs> but it, it takes, <laughs> it takes the way you think about music and your melodic choices and like flips them upside down because suddenly you're not using your body, you know, to make decisions like you would on a keyboard or a guitar. You're using like, you're experimenting because at first you don't know what you're doing. And then you're using systems to like kind of, you can tell these systems to make decisions for you. You know what I mean? Like you can have modules and like set parameters in those modules to only play a certain set of notes, but you don't really decide when those notes are played or what's being played. So you can have like an element of randomness to it. And then you can expand on that. And there's all these sequencers that have different functions that let you control certain aspects or everything or almost nothing. Um, and so that really changed my sound. I was like, oh, I love these notes. I've never played them. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so my sound went from being like this more, like I felt like on guitar, I was trying to achieve some more like ethereal, um, uplifting, um, when I wasn't doing metal, you know. Um, but then when it came to electronic music, I found myself being really drawn to like, like old Massive Attack and, and old Nine Inch Nails kind of stuff where it's like, it's not like atonal or dissonant but it isn't like it's definitely not major and it's not really minor it's this like in between sound you know that's like it's kind of uncomfortable to listen to and uh the the cool thing about euro rack is you can get i mean i don't really know like notes or scales anyways but you can get notes that i know aren't in scales <laughs> and you can make it play things that aren't in tune but that sound really cool and i think the human ear picks up on stuff like that when we're not like familiar with a sound when something is a little bit different like we we sit and we we think on that like wait I don't know if I like that but it's distinct and that distinction can like define you know sounds and, and give something a, a real style so I, I would say getting into Euro rack really helped push me melodically and make choices that I wouldn't make uh, if I were just playing guitar or playing a synth with like, you know, keyboard and stuff. So that was, that's been my last year and a half. <laughs> Sounds like years. you're going into engineering school next. <laughs> oh, don't even get me started. I have, I like have this box that I'm building right now because we have access to like the shop and like all these things mm -hmm. and we get some supplies for free and I'm building this box just to see it's a, uh, and like we have a CNC router and like all these other things. And, uh, and a Adafruit is like a really great resource for stuff like this because they have a lot of like parts for things. So you don't need to build something from the ground up. Like you don't need to like learn Raspberry Pi or like learn everything about breadboarding. You can get like pieces and kind of, it's almost like, like node based coding, but like in life. So they'll give you pieces. You can put them together and do whatever you want with them. As long as you ba know basic soldering and like basic things about electronics. So I learned basic electronics <laughs> and I learned how to solder really, really tiny things. And now I'm working on this box and it has a bunch of like arcade buttons all over it. And it like mm -hmm. lights up colors when you touch the buttons and you can put an SD card in it that has different samples. Um, and it will play those samples through like speakers. So I have these little, like not very good speakers plugged into my box and it just mm -hmm. says dumb. So I like push the buttons and it's not like fully done yet. Otherwise I would just show you um, it's in my studio, but yeah, you push the buttons and it just says dumb stuff. <laughs> and I was like, Oh my gosh, this is truly a gift. Like no, no one should let me like design or build anything. Cause I'm just going to make abominations. <laughs> but, and then I was like, and I had that thought, my ADHD brain, like when I decide I like something, I'm like, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. So I literally looked into going, like dropping out of school for like product and furniture design and going to like electrical engineering so that I can, I was like, I can build synthesizers. I was like, I didn't know you could build synthesizers. So we'll see. Who knows? Maybe next time we uh, video chat, I'll be in engineering school. And I'll be like, check out the synth I made. And then we can collaborate on like synth Strandberg. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's awesome. <laughs> hey, um, Isaac, um, I, I think we've sown enough seeds for topics to ask questions on. Do, do we have anything um, for, for Sarah? Yeah, for sure. Um, let's see here. Question from Eddie. Um, do you feel like playing a Strandberg um, changed the way that you played, helped expand your creativity in writing, maybe approach it differently? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that was like a, a huge deciding factor in in everything that I did. So the guitars that I was playing before I was playing Strandberg had really, really, uh, they were eight strings and a lot of them had a huge necks and like huge, like, like uh, heel carves and stuff. And it was really hard for me to get more like upper fret access. So I was doing a lot more like low chunky metal. And then when I sat down with a Strandberg, A, it was so easy to play. I was like, oh, I can just do everything I've already done twice as fast with half the effort. Um, and I had like, you know, all the fret access. Like it's just, so easy i mean you can get beyond for the access you know it's just like and i'm putting no effort in to even getting all the way down to the eighth string so it's like it really changed everything for me and it's nice because i'm like the biggest klutz ever um i have like a genetic equilibrium problem like my whole family gets vertigo all the time sometimes like my bedroom is like i live in an old like it's a house apartment thing and the floor is slightly angled down and so i just fall over it all the time so it's nice when I'm on stage. That's why I can't headbang very much. I'll just fall into the crowd. Um, <laughs> I don't hit anybody when I'm like, you know, stumbling around. Um, and I don't bump it into as much stuff as I did my other guitar. <laughs> so that's an added value. Um, well, we'll and, put that up on the website. <laughs> yeah. Great for people who just really can't walk a straight line on a good day. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Another question in a in a similar vein: uh, How much does the new model weigh? Is it something you know, something you really need to focus on? It's so light. Strandbergs have always been light, but they're I feel like they're even lighter. Um, that's one of the other things I love uh, is you no strain on your shoulder. You know, no strain if they're sitting in your lap. They're not going to cut off circulation to your leg like some of the bases that I played. Um, it's just. I don't know. They're, they're light. You don't have to worry about the weight at all. Obviously, the eight string is heavier than the six, but the six string, so I guess to make a good comparison, like the six string feels almost as light as a ukulele, and the eight string feels all, like as light as a six string. So they're very light. Um, but they're not unbalanced. So, like, some guitars have heavier necks but light bodies, and they get down. No, these are very, like, centered when you're playing. They're where they sit where you want them to sit. So. Awesome. Yeah, I think technically they're, they're just over two and a half kilos. So whatever that is in pounds, five and a half pounds, 5.7 or something like that, if, if memory serves me. Yeah, it's it's light. Any chance of a Strandberg Long, uh, Sarah Longfield Boots Edition guitar? Oh, um, well, maybe we are potentially working on a new design we'll see where that goes um i don't know if we can really talk about that too much it's kind of a brand new idea that we've just been spitballing so we'll, we'll see how bootsy it becomes too i guess <laughs> yeah that's true if it's super famous then we might have to so maybe i should start a new instagram for him <laughs> Why well, use a uh, one eight string guitar? Um, like why do I use eight strings? You think? I think that's I think that's what this question is about. Yeah. Well, why why eight string over over six string or seven string? Oh, I don't pick eight string over six or seven. I like them all the same. I think they all feel pretty much the same. You know, you can just play things, different styles on different type guitars. The only reason we have the eight string with us right now is because this is what we just released um, a couple of weeks ago. So this is, these were, I mean, I don't think you could get them for a little while because I, I had people messaging me like, I, I want I'm like, I, I don't control production. Like supply is chain everywhere is messed up. I don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your interest. Um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll get everything soon. Um, but yeah, no, the only reason I'm holding the eight is just because that's what, this is the newest NX model that we've got. But I love six. I love sevens. I don't care. I'd play a 12 string. I'd play a four string. I just, it's all it, like, if you can play guitar, you can play any, any amount of strings on a guitar. So there's no, it's just personal preference. You know, I switch between all of them. And so what, what what's coming on the album? Can, can you tell us like, what, what's, what's the style of, of um, the album that's coming? It's so different um, that I'm actually considering pursuing a different name for it um, because it's it might not reach the guitar audience in the way 
that I think they might be expecting. So it's it's kind of a like a two part album, right? So or three, I guess. So I wrote all these songs over the past couple of years, which is like the longest time I've ever spent on anything in my life. Um, so never again. <laughs> and uh, it's it's very dark. It's like dark but poppy. Um, it's heavy on the electronics, but it isn't EDM. Um, it's it's more like soundtrack, like Matrix movie meets like doom eternal meets like video game music and then i have like two different versions of the album that have like exclusive tracks on them i have like one for like like djing at a club or you know like basically doing like here's my whole set but you can like play it at a club because it isn't like you know it, it doesn't do that but i have a version that does and then i have a version with guitar stuff so that i can kind of like hit the whole market of everybody that follows what I do, because I have a lot, a lot of people that are just like, Oh, this is really cool. Electronic music. Like I'm into it. It's its own thing. Then I have guitar players that are like, this needs guitar on it. And then like, if I want to play it out live ever, people need to be able to dance to it. So it's been a mm -hmm. complicated process with many different um, iterations of the same songs that are just a little bit different. So yeah, yeah that's kind of the new album parentheses S I don't know. We'll see. It's exciting. And uh, are, are you singing? Yeah. Yep. The whole album has singing all over it. Oh, um, nice. Yep. Yep. Very different um, from yeah. what I'm used to. So. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Thank and you. Me too. Uh, uh, what, what's, what's your process as, as like a uh, one person band how, how far do you take it and, and and how much are are you outsourcing in, in in the whole process well so i used to do absolutely everything um just because i think there was like part of me that felt like i needed to prove myself um when i was a lot younger you know what i mean because so many people the guitar community at 10 12 years ago was very different than it is now i know that doesn't sound like a lot of time but it really was it was um, I had a lot of people that was like, they were, they thought like, oh, my parents bought me all this stuff. Like, no, they did not. They're great, but they did not do any of that. Um, and then like, you know, or my boyfriend wrote the music for me or, you know, just all this stuff. And it kind of gave me like a, an insecurity about, you know, well, I don't want people thinking that like, I, I didn't do this myself. Like I need to be able to prove to myself and, and apparently other people that, that I can, you know? Um, so I learned how to do everything myself and mixed and mastered and released and wrote all the instruments. And, um, and then I became a, even more of a control freak and was like, I love this process and I want no one involved in it ever. <laughs> <laughs> to, to detriment. Um, I still write all the music and record all the parts. Um, and for my guitar music, I just hire people um, to play it out with me on tour. Cause like I said, I can't let go. I can't let go, <laughs> but I'm finally at the point where I'm willing to relinquish mastering so um right now i'm having the one person that i trust I, i've only ever had him work on my my masters ever in the last like 10 years and i've had like big name producers like hit me up and be like i will help you mix and master that i'm like i no i can't you don't know my process only this one person <laughs> knows my process is the only guy i trust i'm sorry um so that's what i've been able to relinquish i would like to start a band I think where I can just like go into it knowing that I'm not going to be in control of everything and like that would be nice to step back from everything and I'm going to be playing synths uh for Derek's band Ladder Math I'm sure a lot of people that might be watching this probably know who he is and probably have maybe checked out his band um so that'll be a, a good break it's nice to not have to you know be the one that's in charge of everything I hate being anybody's boss so yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's. Kind of I'm trying to learn to let go, for the betterment of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but do, do, do you think of yourself as, as an entrepreneur? I don't know what I think of myself as. I think of myself as, like, someone that has tried so many different things. I've tried so many different jobs and different like places of the country and different you know areas of you know, creative jobs. And I, I just, I hate all of it. 
<laughs> so I think <laughs> maybe entrepreneur might be my only option or um, yeah, solo artist, entrepreneur, something like that. I, I want to make things and I want to make new things, whether that's new music or a box that you press buttons and it lights up and does stuff and says stuff that nobody wants. Or if I end up designing and making backpacks for a living, like that would be cool. I just don't think I can work under people. <laughs> so yeah. I'm gonna have to figure it out real quick. <laughs> So. But so where um, where does like YouTube and being being a, a YouTuber um, fit into to things now? Well, I've always been a reluctant YouTuber, um, even since I was like I started YouTube when I was 13 or 14, um, just because when I was looking at videos on there to learn stuff, I saw this girl, Megan, the metal queen. She was playing Lamb of God songs. And I was like, oh, I I can play that, but I can play the solo. So I should do this. Because she's mm -hmm. like huge on here because of doing that. And, you know, I was like in middle school. So I was like, yeah, whatever. So I, I did some guitar covers. And then I decided that YouTube is stupid and I wanted to go to art school. Um, and then I did not get into art school. So I applied for all the other colleges. and I didn't get into any colleges. So I applied for music college. And I didn't get into any music colleges. And so I was like, all right, you know, <laughs> clearly I'm not meant to be doing this right now. So then I just started focusing on music. Um, and when I joined up with Steve and we made the fine constant. He was like, you need to get back into making YouTube videos if we ever want to tour because like people will watch them and like, that's going to be the key. And I was like, Oh yeah, do I have to. So <laughs> Steve, <laughs> the most of the videos I made from like 2011 to 2015 were prompted by Steve. Cause he was like, if you make this video, this band might reach out to us and that'll be a connection we can make. And I'm like, not thinking about any of that, you know, me ADHD brain, totally unmedicated until like last year. I'm like not thinking that far ahead at all. Um, but he was totally right. Um, so that's why I had to get back into YouTube. And then I met Rob Scallon and he was like, you really need to keep doing YouTube. You can make a living off of doing YouTube. And that had not occurred to me. Um, Cause I had, I, <laughs> I was like living at Steve's parents' house for a while. Wonderful people, truly great. They've taken in a lot of us. Um, and uh, then I was living in my rehearsal space for a while. And so I was like, Oh, nice. It would be cool to not have to work at guitar center anymore. Um, so then I got a little bit more invested into YouTube, made some videos with Rob. Um, but I really am horrible with cameras. Like I'm, I'm bad at lighting, <laughs> even like up to this, like I'm horrible at lighting. I hate video editing, especially like just footage of my face. Like that's just a, it's just a, I don't know. It's weird. It's very strange. You're watching yourself age in real time. Um, so that's been a, you know, maybe, I don't know if I had a team of people, if I made enough money doing YouTube to have a whole team of people that are like helping me shoot and edit and keep me on a schedule, I feel like I would enjoy it because when I'm focused on the content, then it's awesome. But it's all the logistics surrounding the content that becomes such a, uh, such a, I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> it's just a stressful thing for me. There's so many, you know, you have like scripts and lighting and like settings and environments and you have to figure out like what what you're going to film, where you're going to film it, how many parts, how many angles, how many shots. And, and then you have to edit and edit takes, you know, a week. Um, so I think it's not creatively fulfilling for me to do YouTube, but I have to keep doing YouTube and find a way to enjoy it to currently sustain myself until I'm done with school, which I'm so grateful I can do. Don't get me wrong. It's just not something I'm naturally good at, um, where I feel like my friends that are YouTubers are naturally good at it and love it. They love making videos and like, you know, editing videos. And I, I just don't feel like a YouTuber, you know? I don't feel like an in front of the camera person. I feel like a, I don't know, a sit in your room and design a different camera person, you know? Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> One that like blocks out your face, you know? I yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know how much you've been sitting in front of a, a, a picture of yourself these past two years, but I certainly have, and I'm I'm tired of seeing myself. Um, thank you. Gotta... <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's just like it's a weird. It becomes sort of meta. You're like, 
wow, I talk out of one side of my mouth a little bit. You know, it's like these weird things you don't want to know. Like, I don't want to know this. Like, I find out like this eye like droops more than the other eye. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I don't like care. <laughs> I don't want to think about it. And then it's, it's like, what, like when you're aging in real time, since I started doing it when I was 14, I'm like, that's a new wrinkle. You know, it's like <laughs> something I would think about if I didn't have to look at myself when I was and it's fine when you look in a mirror, you're like, oh, a new wrinkle, cool. And then you go get a snack or something. But like when you're staring at yourself for like six hours, like, oh, my, that's a special that's like DMV level punishment. So mm-hmm. people that love it, props to them. Yeah, I, I, I generally don't wear my glasses like when I'm in the bathroom. So I, I don't even see myself in the mirror. So I just see it on the computer. It's horrible. <laughs> that's what I tell Derek. I'm like, just. When, when we get old, just leave your glasses off, okay? Like, it'll be great because he can't see anything <laughs> without his glasses, so. And I need my glasses, too, but when we had the masks, I can't wear them because they get all fogged up, and then my eyes get, it's just a problem. So I just was like, whatever, I'll just be more blind. I don't care. I'm not Derek-level <laughs> blind, so it's fine. <laughs> so, uh, Isaac, any more questions? Yes, I think one uh, a lot of people can... Uh, relate to someone's asking about going from a regular job to more of a freelance artist how did you do it Sarah <laughs> how did I do it <laughs> I don't even know <laughs> it, it is, I wake up every day and I'm like holy shit <laughs> like uh, I keep bouncing back and forth between the two um, because you know change is good um, I've had probably mm, 12 to 15 jobs in the past 15 years <laughs> Um, so, uh, I think the key, if I were to do it and not be me, I would have a plan. Um, and the key to doing any like online thing and making money doing it, I hate to say it is just consistency. It's just a grind. If you are willing to put out like three videos a week on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, you will blow up like probably doing anything just because you have the stamina that 99% of the population doesn't have. So if you are fully driven about a thing and you're knowledgeable about it, and it's not something that already exists necessarily, I mean, it can be similar, but if you have like kind of your own thing going on, it's newish and you're willing to dedicate every waking moment of your life for the next two and a half years, that's, that's how you would do it. Um, I got lucky in that when I started doing it, it was, it was new. Um, so I was able to kind of get a little bit of a leg up before anybody else was already doing that. And that was just pure luck. Um, but if I were to do it now, that's probably what I would have to do is just grind content, make as many videos as you can, um, try to find some kind of niche. It doesn't matter. It can be anything. If people make the weirdest stuff, um, I think there's some guy that just sits in a chair and drinks whiskey for like four hours and that's the video. Like, you know, at anything that you can think to do, um, if that's what you want to do. If you're doing music, see if you can find something that hasn't quite been done yet or that's new-ish. You know, I mean, there's always going to be, like, there's beer reviewers, those exist. But if you can bring a new angle to whether it's teaching or, like, playing or, you know, break, taking things apart and, like, you know, circuit bending them, there's people that do that. Or, like, redesigning stuff, um... Or, you know, making covers in different genres. There's always a market for that. So I would say plan, find a niche, and then just grind. It will take probably a year to two years, depending. Music is hard. Um, I have friends that are in, like, makeup and, um, like, gaming, and it's not, not not as hard. It's oversaturated for them, too, but it's not as hard to make make a living um, as I think it is as a musician. Even, even artists, like, I have visual artist friends that are having – they have a much easier time with it. Um, so music is definitely one of the hardest things that you can try to pursue on the internet, but I, it is worth it just for the community, I guess. Um, like the YouTube community for musicians is just, everybody's so friendly and so nice. And that's, that's the other main reason I've stuck with it is just because like my YouTube friends are just so cool. <laughs> you know, they're like the smartest, like most, they're always, they're great problem solvers. They're brilliant. They're creative. They're, they're all super strange um, and have such an unusual perspective on so many things. I'm just like, I would never have thought of this ever. That's brilliant. So, I mean, for that reason alone, I would definitely say try to do it, but it, it just takes time. So, 
Well, that's a really good uh, segue into this next question. Uh, are there any other YouTubers you'd like to collaborate with? The videos you've done with Rob Scott and Adam Neely are great. Um, I mean, I would love to collaborate with like so many YouTubers. Um, my friend Travarsi, she lives out in LA. She does a bunch of Eurorack stuff and she's huge about like building community and she's connected to so many people. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, a lot of the people I want to collaborate with, I've already collaborated with. So I would just like to continue, you know, collaborating with them. Like Colin Scott, CS Guitars, like Ryan Bruce, more videos with Rob. Um, I'd like to do more videos with Andrew Wong because he kind of bridges that gap between like a lot of different genres of music and guitar players and electronic musicians. Um, oh man, there's just so many. It's it's hard to. I mean, almost every music video, music YouTuber that like I watch, I'm like that would be so cool to collaborate. But I also, I'm so busy all the time that I I feel like I would reach out and be like let's collaborate and then forget that I asked them. <laughs> so like, I need to like get to a point in my life where I'm super organized um maybe get some ADHD coaching someone to teach me how to answer my emails the second I get them you know like <laughs> or just get a handler um someone that's just like Sarah you need to wake up now it's time to eat breakfast answer your emails like I need an adult parent to parent me and then I think I would feel confident reaching out to people to collaborate with them because I don't feel like I would forget and fail so <laughs> it's an ongoing thing <laughs> when like when when you were starting to do the the youtube thing what was there like a defining moment that that like made you huge or or, or that, that was like took you from from one level to to the next there were a couple and it wasn't was that, it's not a collaboration that that's kind of what i'm getting at or, or yeah, was it there... something else organic well, collaborating on YouTube is great, and I would recommend it to everyone because it helps cross, like, I don't know, pollinate your channel so that you kind of share a market and share an audience. Um, but no, the first time that one of my YouTube videos took off, it was like, I think it was a human abstract solo that I recorded when I was like 14. And they saw it and posted it to their Twitter. And then All Show Parish reposted something because they saw that I'd also covered some of their songs. And so that's kind of where that started. That was like the first little bump this was in like 2007 2008 um and then it happened again a couple times with some of the other covers that I posted um and I did some Ashuga covers that did really really well um and then I collaborated with Rob and that that really took off um I know you, I'm sure most of you have probably seen some of the videos I've done with him though that took off interestingly because I'm not like a, a death metal vocalist um so people were like Sarah like you need to be screaming like I'm like no I don't do this <laughs> I just did it with Rob because he's my friend um but that, that isn't my uh my niche so I had a it was a good thing and that it kind of like really bumped up my audience and my view count but it was also maybe not in the exact direction that I had intended on going <laughs> you know that's common <laughs> with people in YouTube they're always like oh I didn't didn't think this one was going to take off. And then, you know, it does. And, and then I got to a point, um, I did a, another Meshuggah cover. It did really, really well. And I decided I don't really want to do covers anymore. Cause I was, I didn't want to be seen as just a cover artist. Cause that was not who I was. I'm like a very independent original artist and I like to make things. And even if they suck, they're still my things that I made. You know what I mean? I don't want to be in a cover band. I don't want to be known as like the girl that just plays covers. I want to, people to see what the, what I like to do and the things that, you know, make me who I am. You know, I feel like it's hard to do something forever disingenuously. And I did feel like the covers that I were doing, that I was doing, like I liked the music, but there was some level of disingenuousness to it because it wasn't me, you know? Like I was doing those covers to try to land tours and to make connections and network and it worked, but it wasn't the audience necessarily that I would have been looking for. And it wasn't, it eventually got me into the community I wanted to be in. But at the time I just felt, I don't know, I felt out of place. So then I decided I was going to be done with that. So my YouTube viewership went down, um, but now it's, I'm, I'm, I'm much happier. It's growing again and, and Instagram is growing and, but it's in the direction that I want. You know, it's like, I have people that understand that like, oh yeah, Sarah likes to make all kinds of things. And she likes to make electronic music and metal and guitar music. And she likes to sing and paint and do all these other things. And like, so it's just better now, you know? So I don't even remember what the first question was, but, or what that question was, but. 
<laughs> no, I was just asking if, if there was like a defining moment that, that took you from one level to, to, to another, but I guess it's like cover is the answer. And mm -hmm. that's like what you were doing, which is yeah, almost like, except the, the person you're covering might not know it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Um, Isaac, you got any more questions going? Yes, uh, question here. How, how do you overcome self-doubt and uh, self-destructive feelings um, when you're on camera or uh, I think just in the creative process in general? Um. Well, I think if the universe blessed me with anything, it's a short-term memory problem. <laughs> so anytime I'm truly troubled by anything, I usually forget about it the next day. <laughs> so I just keep moving, you know, I think it's, uh, it's good to just you just keep going because there's so much stuff you can't you literally just can't do anything about there's situations you find yourself in, and like doubts that you're gonna have but like, that doesn't change anything just like, uh, I've always said like, positive feedback and negative feedback have the same impact on me, which is they don't, you know what I mean? It doesn't change what I'm going to do because I already have a plan on what I'm going to do. So it's kind of like even my own internal positive and negative like reactions to things. I try to just let them be whatever they're going to be because tomorrow I'll probably feel differently. And I usually do. I change my mind all the time. So, <laughs> you know, it's not too bad. You just have to like forget about things and just not go there. So <laughs> that's how I do it. And uh, I've been meaning to ask you, um, on this topic, because I, I I think being on the road with your music is something you might rather forget. But <laughs> will you take new music on the road? I will be. Um, so I do. Touring is really hard for me, um, not because I don't enjoy it, but it's because I have such bad. It's like a combination of like anxiety and OCD and like a bunch of other comorbid issues. Um, that are, and I know a lot of people are like, oh, I'm anxious, like, oh, I'm OCD. No, I am like the clinical, like, need two therapists, like, we alternate medicine, like, I am like an identifiable problem. My therapist was like, I was talking to her a couple months ago, and she was like, you need to just like start applying for disability because like it's gonna take a few years for you to get it anyways. I was like, did I break therapy? Like, is this the end when a therapist goes to apply for disability? I was like, I don't need disability, I'm just struggling, okay. She was like, there's no shame. There's no shame in needing to be on disability. I was like, I mean, the problem with that, though, is that anyways, that's a rant for another day. But so, uh, yeah, it, it really goes against a lot of my um, my my problems. I struggle a lot. But touring is important because then I get more normal when I get home because it's like forced exposure therapy to everything that makes me just suffer. Um, and then when I get home, I'm like, oh, I feel like just so relieved and I get more normal. So I have to tour. Um, and I am going to tour my electronic music, but, uh, differently. Um, I'd like to just, I mean, my goal would be to play like underground clubs in Berlin. You know what I mean? Like that would be real sweet. Um, you know, just to like Germans that, that don't show emotion, don't really care about the music. They're just standing there like nodding occasionally, you know, like that's totally my vibe. So I would love to do like a couple weeks of like just playing dark techno and strange uh, experimental electronic music to everybody in Germany and, and uh, certain parts of Europe. Um, but I always will keep continuing to tour guitar stuff, you know, because that's where all my friends are at. You know, I see them on the road all the time. So that's that's an upside to touring. Um, playing live is, I don't know, it doesn't really feel any different than playing at home. I'm not really a, like a performer, like how some people just get on stage and they like thrive off of the energy of the crowd. I feel like I'm like up there and I'm like, I'm, minus, I'm so in my head, like head empty, no thoughts when I'm playing guitar that I could be in my room doing the same thing. Feels the same to me, but I like to hang out with my friends. So, yeah. yeah. What, what's, what, what's your happiest tour memory? Oh man, I have so many happy tour memories. Um, I would say it was probably we were on a tour with um, Drusif and, and a bunch of our friends and it was one of the last shows a tour and oh man, that was such a chaotic tour, but in a good way, it could have been on like MTV real world. That's how chaotic it was. Um, and we stayed at uh, my guitar player, Steve-O's house and he has a pool 
Um, and so it was like, we were just partying. I mean, when you're, when you're like 22 and touring, you can party when you're older than that, you can't, your body can't take it. But when you're young, you totally can. So we were partying and drinking and eating and hanging out all day and going swimming and hanging in the hot tub. And it was just like, you know, 15 friends just getting crazy uh, for a couple of nights. So I think that was one of my favorite, favorite tour memories. It was um, us and Animus at that point. At, that was all that was left. <laughs> oh, and Drew was, Drew was there too. I was gonna say we had a couple like lineup or uh, band lineup changes, but yeah, the Drew Sif crew and Animus and us, and we all were eating and just barbecuing and grilling and swimming and drinking, and it was fun. So, yeah. So there, there's 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 at least happy places to escape to if if, you, if you're on tour again. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i mean it's ups and downs like that's part of what yeah. also makes tours so good is like the downs are like quickly replaced by the ups because everything is happening so fast you don't really have time to think about either thing so but there's there's always good stuff with tour even if it's hard for me in in ways that it wouldn't be for other people necessarily mm. yeah i can't even imagine just i mean hanging with i've met enough of you Strandberg artists because I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm totally outside the, the music business normally or from my previous life. But I've, I've hung out with enough of you on tour to know that I would never want to. <laughs> there are there are things that are so gross that like you just you're like, I wish that would have never happened in my life. Um, like when you're violently sick and you're like in a van and you have to sleep in a van with like 10 other people and like thing then you're in the desert and it's like 110 degrees and you can't turn the car on because you can't afford the gas to run and like or if you're Derek like and you have um IBS and you have to go right now and we're in the middle of nowhere Canada and so he just runs into the woods like there are things that are so unglamorous or when you go into the gas station bathroom and it's a thousand times grosser than if you just went into the woods um, and you have to make that decision. You're like, okay, do I, am I going to, am I going to poop here? Or am I literally just going to go and try to find a stump? Like, what are my options? Um, and then you really get to know the people you're touring with because you see things in that, like, I don't even think married couples see. So if you really want to know somebody, go on tour with them. <laughs> it's really a miracle that bands can, can tour and, and still be friends. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I mean, l luckily people do. And, and you can actually go and watch gigs. That's it's amazing. Yes. <laughs> hey, um, Isaac, a minute or two left. Uh, uh, last final question or two. Yeah, sure. This is one that uh, I'm personally curious about. But what, what kinds of things do you think about when you make your album artwork, Sarah? And uh, and what artists have influenced your drawing and painting style? It's super unique um, to, to you, I find. That's so tough to say. Because usually when I'm making album art, I'm like panicking last minute. I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot I have to release this album. So I just like sit down and make something. Um, I usually try not to make something that like directly falls into like my artistic style, but it ends up usually looking like it anyways. Um, and my inspirations, oh, that's so tough. I really, it's like, it's like hundreds of different people. I follow so many Instagram accounts that are like weird. I like weird surrealist like modern surrealist art um where like the dimensions don't make sense and there's like a lot of like more basic forms like merging into other things um so you're getting like ideas of sort of what's happening but kind of what isn't happening and then i'm also really inspired by like 2009 to 2013 like illustrative graphic style um that was very like line work and bright colors and um like contrasting gradients um and now it's moved to this like weird style of like blocky humanoid figures um like you know the facebook how like the graphics that facebook uses like a lot of companies are using that i don't really love that style i like more like complex line work like like high information pieces where there's a lot to take in but who knows that might change kind of like this poster back here oops wrong direction Mm -hmm. I like stuff like that. So, yeah. Very nice. Uh, do you have a final question, Isaac? <clears throat> yes. Um, will you be touring your modular synth stuff when it comes out, Sarah? Yeah. Um, 
I don't know about touring yet. Um, I do have a few shows lined up because um, that's a whole different market. And I, my current booking agent, I don't know if he has connections in that like side of things. So I've just been offered like one-off gigs. Um, but I would like to tour it. Um, and I think the modular setup, it would be more than just like my Euro rack. It would be a, I'm still working it out because it's so complicated. And the, like, the amount of vocal effects that I have going on, like no shame in that. A lot of people are like, well, you need to sing without any effects at all. I'm like, nope, I'm going to sing with as many effects as I want. There's nine layers in my vocals and I want to recreate all of them. <laughs> so I have to figure out the vocal, the vocal setup and routing and how to get all the tempos to sync up and what I'm going to have planned ahead of time and what I'm going to improvise. So once I get that figured out, then I'll be more like, okay, I can definitely tour this if that's an opportunity. But for right now, one-off gigs are great because then I can test those things and see what works and see what doesn't. So yeah. And it'll be both. Like I said, I'll still be playing guitar shows and touring guitar music and I'm working on a whole new guitar album. Um, now that I'm finally done with the electronic stuff, I can bounce back to that. So It'll still be both. And sometimes both at the same show. You never know. <laughs> so we'll see. And if <clears throat> if you're dying to find out what you're doing at the earliest opportunity, what's what's like the best place to follow you? In Instagram, Facebook, do you post ever, everything on, on both? Usually Instagram is like the most dedicated um, to strictly just my music and my plans for that. Um, so Right now, yeah, Instagram is definitely the best place to, to figure out what I'm up to and what I'm doing. Facebook is, I post some relevant things to Facebook. Mostly I post memes, so <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't need a bigger Facebook audience. Like I cause enough trouble, so <laughs> just find me on Instagram. Well, um, and your brand new guitar is available at the yeah. Scramble Guitars website. Um, select dealers, including in the store at Guitar Center, various mm -hmm. locations. And um, yeah, go get it if you haven't already. <laughs> um, always a pleasure talking to you, Sarah. It's Likewise. Been long. Yeah, good to catch up. Sounds like you're in a good place. I think. <laughs> yeah. Whenever lots of chaotic things are happening, I'm generally in as good of a place as I can get. So yes, it's good. <laughs> All right. Awesome. I think um, we'll wrap it up there. And um, to everyone that's been watching, um, thanks a million for, for hanging with us um, and join us again soon um you never know when we'll pop up again so follow our channels and um isaac bring sarah back so we can wave there say bye to everyone sarah <laughs> sorry it froze up <laughs> bye <laughs> all right everyone thanks for watching um hope to see you soon again